let's let's talk about you know how heart and lung function together, right? Like the cardiorespiratory you know system and how vigorous intensity activity really plays a role there as well. Yeah, so I think similar to kind of the cardiovascular stress, the endothelial stress, higher intensities of exercise are going to increase you know metabolic demand, increase your oxygen demand in your muscles, which is going to force your body to need it needs to deliver more oxygen to your working muscles. That means your heart is going to work harder. Your stroke volume is going to go up. So stroke volume for people who may not be familiar, it's the amount of blood that your heart is pumping out per beat. So it fills with blood and it pumps it out and in usually expressed in something like liters per minute, that would be your, your stroke volume. It forces your stroke volume to go up. Your heart rate obviously goes up during more vigorous exercise, but also your lungs are going to fill and, you know, be stressed more to deliver more of that oxygen to your body. And so that's another one of these reasons why vigorous and, you know, even zone two intensity of exercise up to a point, they're going to stress the cardio, the cardiac system, the heart and the lungs more. That's going to force your body to adapt and your heart is going to get stronger. Your lungs are going to get stronger. And I think one of the key adaptations there is obviously, again, the the increase in, in stroke volume that you get. That's one of the best predictors, or that's the main thing that increases when VO2 max increases. So if you look at these studies showing, you know, what's the main adaptation that gives you a better VO2 max, it's higher stroke volume because that gives you a greater cardiac output. Your heart can pump more blood to your body. You can use more oxygen during exercise. And so that's one of the reasons why HIT is so effective because it increases your oxygen demand more. It forces your heart to work harder and you're improving that that stroke volume. And then same thing with the lungs. I think the lungs are a little bit not less adaptable, but they do adapt less because in a lot of people, unless you have asthma or something like that, the lungs are a little overbuilt uh, maybe for exercise. Like most of us have plenty of lung function, but the heart is really what's going to adapt there. And so I think that, you know, again, is why we see this efficiency with his vigorous ex intensity exercise in this study and in others, because you're just, the heart is being stressed more and you're going to have a stronger heart if you're engaging in more higher intensity activities that are forcing the heart to adapt. Going back to Ben Levine, I think he cited, you know, that similar study, but he talked about how, especially after say age 50, 60, 70, you need these higher intensities. Again, it doesn't have to be hit, but it has to be pretty vigorous to force the heart to adapt and prevent cardiac fibrosis, cardiac stiffening of the heart. If you don't get that high intensity training, um, you know, like low intensity really just doesn't cut it. And so, you know, in this study, the cohort that we're talking about, they were aged 40 to 79. So that might be why vigorous exercise had this outsized benefit on specifically cardiovascular outcomes, that eight to one ratio, like you mentioned, that incredible, like higher than some of these other outcomes. Um, so I think that's why there was that outsized benefit as well. Yeah, I think for people um, with respect to like, why is it important to improve your VO2 max, you know, your cardiorespiratory fitness, that being a pretty important marker for longevity and you know, for lowering your your risk of death from all causes of mortality, right? So essentially, like, we've talked about this before last podcast we did together, right? Where people with the highest cardiorespiratory fitness as measured by VO2 max, mm -hmm. they had a five-year increased life expectancy compared to the lowest people with the lower or lowest cardiorespiratory fitness or the eight, they had a 80% lower all-cause mortality, right? So any way you look at it, you know, if you are in that higher cardiorespiratory fitness range, you are talking about, you know, a, a lifespan, life expectancy, you know, extension if you, compared to if you were not in that, in that range. For sure. And after about age 30 to 40 into your 50s, your VO2 max starts to decline about 10% per decade. So if you're not doing something to maintain that, yes, you can build it up as much as you can into your 30s and 40s. But if you aren't engaging in moderate to vigorous intensity exercises at age 40, 50, 60, 70, your VO2 max is just going to continue to drop 10% per decade. The only way to maintain that or even build that is to do these more vigorous types of exercise. But the last thing I think that is important with vigorous exercise for, especially when we're talking in the context of older adults, is this muscle fiber recruitment. So most people will be aware that muscle fibers are categorized into different types. We have type one, which are referred to as slow twitch muscle fibers. Then we have type two. There are subsets of type two and maybe don't need to go into the details of those, but we have two A, two B, and then two X. They kind of go on this spectrum from very fast oxidative glycolytic to sort of these this mix between aerobic and glycolytic fibers. But we'll just put them in these buckets of type one and type two for now. Type two are fast twitch, type one are slow twitch fibers. During low intensity activity, we're going to activate those low or those slow twitch fibers. So if you're leisurely walking, you're 
doing the dishes, just to use some of the examples from, from this study, you're going to be activating those low intensity, those type one fibers. Even if you're doing something like endurance exercise, for the most part, probably type one fibers are going to be activated. And then as you increase the intensity of exercise, increase the force of, you know, or the weight of something that you're moving, if you're lifting weights, that you're going to progressively activate more type one fibers and then move on to the type two fibers eventually. And so in the context of this study, I think, you know, why are we seeing this outsized impact of uh, vigorous movement throughout the day? Well, if you're doing more vigorous movement, you're activating these type two fibers more um, and you're giving them more of a stimulus. And type two fibers are the type of fibers that will atrophy first and lose strength first with with age. So you lose type two fibers first and then we move down to losing those type one or weakening of type one fibers. And so the more vigorous exercise you're engaging in, just even if it's just chores, even if it's, if you pick up a box, you're engaging type two fibers, depending on how heavy that box is, obviously. If you're carrying your kid, you might be engaging type two fibers. Um, so just doing this more vigorous activity throughout the day, and then obviously engaging in high intensity exercise and vigorous exercise, you're going to engage more of those type two fibers. And those play, I think, a role, uh, important role in a few things. So for diabetes, going back to what you talked about, more glucose. So if you can activate those type two fibers, you're going to be able to use more glucose, better your insulin sensitivity, lower your fasting blood glucose. Um, but with the all-cause mortality too, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I know that one of the people who talks about this most is like Peter Tia, but you know, the leading cause of death or one of the leading causes of death among older adults is you fall, you break a hip, you're in bed for several weeks. You never recover from that. Well, what type two fibers are important for? These are these are the power fibers. These are what, if you trip over something and you need to catch yourself or you need to just prevent yourself from falling, the type two fibers are what are going to be responsible for that. And if you have more power producing fibers, stronger type two fibers, you're going to be less likely to fall. Hence, you're going to be less likely to experience these disuse atrophy or these um, catabolic crises as you've referred to it before. And so I think that when you look at a cohort of adults like this one, over 70,000 people who inevitably are probably experiencing falls at older ages. And that could be one of the reasons contributing to their all cause mortality rate. Um, that goes, you know, they're doing more vigorous, vigorous activity. They're less likely to fall. They probably have a lower um, chance of experiencing all cause mortality. And so just trying to tie that into maybe a few of the different outcomes in this study, diabetes and all cause mortality. I think that's why we see the benefit there is because if you're doing more of this low or this high intensity activity throughout the day, you're engaging more type two fibers and we got to protect those. Um, so the ones that go first, power and strength decline with age. And that's a result of the loss of type two fibers primarily. Really good points, Brady. I 100% agree. I mean, I think that's probably really tied into the the reduction in all-cause mortality. And it's also, you know, one of the big reasons why I, I, I engage in CrossFit. I do a, cross, a lot of CrossFit types of training because I'm getting, I'm getting the functional, I'm getting the explosive power, I'm getting the strength, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing I'm doing all that type of um, resistance training, but it's mixed in with aerobic and these high intensity, vigorous, you know, types of workouts. And so you're really just getting it all. And, and for me, it's it's a very time efficient, great way to get the whole shebang, right? It's not just the the cardiorespiratory um, improvements, but also the effects on the muscle improvements and muscle health and strength as well. That kind of gets it transitions us into this special populations. You know, does is there is there any population that we have to be concerned about for doing you know vigorous intensity? And I do get this question a lot from people, older adults. I'm old. Can I do a vigorous type of workout again? We're not talking necessarily about just high intensity interval training, although that does include it. We're talk also talking about, you know, maybe cycling or, you know, ru running or jogging in a, to a point. I think even jogging was considered more mm -hmm. vigorous, right? So um, like you had pointed out, you know, this study included adults that were up to age 79. So they're definitely older adults, 65 and older, right? So older adults did massively benefit from engaging in vigorous intensity uh, physical activity. Um, I would say that, you know, most most of people that are older and let's say they've never really done any kind of vigorous intensity activity, 
it's not that you have to just start it right away. You can work your way up progressively, right? I mean, that's just something to keep in mind. Like it's easy to kind of just work your way up to it. Start out with the interval walking and then like start in doing a little bit of light jogging in sometimes. Or or maybe you're just going to be that person that does these short, you know, one minute chair squats or, you know, something that's th you're going to accumulate more of the shorter intervals throughout the day as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it is important to point out that... Um, as you're getting older, as you mentioned, you know, the muscle mass, engaging the type 2 fibers because they're really going, uh, your cardiorespiratory fitness is, is decreasing. I mean, all of these things, there's so much, I would say, um, there's so many reasons why older adults should be trying to engage in some form of vigorous intensity activity and not just following the moderate intensity aspect of the guidelines. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that for one, any, you know, Obviously, even old or young, if you've never done HIT, high intensity, vigorous exercise, you need to ease yourself into it. You need to kind of, you know, adapt to it before you do it. But there are, I mean, hundreds of studies on, let's just use, keep using the Norwegian 4 by 4 for example, but adults can do that protocol safely, effectively, several times per week. And they're not burning out. They're not, it's not unsustainable. I mean, you hear all these words and it's just like, for the people doing the research, and even in graduate school, I was a part of several of these different studies where we used the Norwegian 4x4 and we were looking at the effect of on endothelial function. And we had people who were 65 years old with diabetes coming in and they were doing a couple of these 4x4 protocols a week, 85% heart rate max. It's like, you can do it. I mean, they're it's the only exercise that they're doing. It's a couple times per week. And even if it's 85% max heart rate, it's it's a fairly low absolute intensity because they're not that in shape. So people can do it. And then I think it's important, you know, older adults can do it and they need to do it. Going back to what Ben Levine was talking about. I mean, at a certain age, past a certain age, if you don't engage in the vigorous exercise, you're just not going to adapt, especially with regard to the cardiac, the cardi cardiac adaptations, the cardiovascular system. The heart just needs that extra stimulus. And without it, the heart's just going to continue to stiffen fibrosis as you age. I know we already sort of mentioned that, but um, so yeah, not only is it feasible, but it's probably necessary for, for older adults to engage in this high intensity interval training. I just think that there's this skewed idea when you talk about doing hit that people think it's they're training like Olympic athletes and it's it's really not. It's Thank you, Brady. <laughs> just read the some of the clinical studies yeah, and I mean uh, it's pretty apparent. There there's definitely a group of people that like to push back when I, you know, in any time I like post or talk about doing the Norwegian four by four for some reason. It's it's really I'm not I mean, I'm not talking about like nonstop Norwegian four by four, like four times a day, every day, you know, five times a, a week. I mean, this is like you know, once or twice a week, you can do it. Like it's not, and again, like you said, it's a, it's a you know it, the relative you know heart rate changes, right? So for someone who's not that fit, you know, eighty five percent of their max heart rate is not that. It's not that hard. Uh, right. I guess it's it hard for them, but like right, it might be fifty to one hundred watts or something if they're on a bike, which is a fairly low. Low. You know, it's like right. spin class, something like that. yeah.